Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Rare Book Room. My name is Peter, and I'm director at the events here at Strand. For a little bit of history, Strand was founded in 1927 by the Bass family over on what was then Fourth Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until, after over 92 years, Strand is the sole survivor, still run by the Bass family, still, well, now running 400 events a year, and still housing new and used books. Tonight, I am very excited to welcome back Ryan Holiday to the Rare Book Room for the release of Stillness is the Key. It follows his many best-selling books, including The Obstacle is the Way, Ego is the Enemy, and others in drawing on the wisdom of timeless philosophy for insights into strategy and success. His books have been translated into over 30 languages and sold over 2 million copies worldwide. We were thrilled last year to help launch Conspiracy, his look at the complicated and hugely influential case that brought down Gawker, and I could not be more excited to have him back with us tonight. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ryan Holiday to The Strand. How's everyone doing? Good. Thank you for coming. Sorry, this is a little precarious. Uh, I guess I would say I'm a bit of a hypocrite standing here today. I wrote this book about stillness. As you know, I appreciate you guys coming. But uh, there's basically nothing less still than a book launch. Um, it's been uh, several months of, of nonstop stuff. Uh, and what's interesting about it, uh, when I think about it, I was thinking about this uh, on Monday night. This is the ninth time I've done this, uh, voluntarily. Um, I, my wife thinks there's probably something wrong with me and there's some, some truth to that. But when I talk about stillness, I'm, I'm not talking about the stillness of not doing things. I'm not talking about the stillness of retreating from the world, whether it's to an ashram in India or a, you know, a, a beautiful uh, silent meditation retreat in the hills of some beautiful monastery. I'm, I'm talking about stillness in the real world. How does someone access and have stillness while they're doing whatever it is they're doing? In my case, it's publishing, but maybe you work on Wall Street or maybe you're in the armed forces or you're starting a company. I'm, I'm interested in, in how one accesses stillness in that and how stillness allows you to be better at whatever it is that you're doing. So this book is very much influenced by Eastern philosophy, but I think there's a reason that Eastern philosophy hasn't resonated as much in the West. It's because fundamentally there is a, a, a cultural difference. We live in a world defined by sort of Western values, and those Western values Im imply and engage uh, a more sort of active participatory experience. And so... I was fascinated by this idea that stillness appears in, uh, as often in the works of Marcus Aurelius and Seneca and Epictetus as it does in Confucius or Buddha or, or any of the, the Eastern thinkers. And then I was particularly intrigued to find that stillness appears in Christianity, in Hinduism, uh, in Epicureanism, in all the schools. It's this sort of one common thread between all of them. And I was struck again by the analogy in biology that independently species sometimes evolve very similar features or adaptations, even though they don't share an ancestor. Like how is it that birds and bats both fly, but not because they descended from one common ancestor, but they, they, they were responding to some biological or evolutionary need. And I think that's why stillness, whether it's the, the Buddhist version of stillness or the Stoic version of stillness or the Epicurean version of stillness or the Christian stillness, it's fundamentally that they were converging on a similar truth that um, when you look at uh, whether it's, I like your shirts, uh, when, when you look at, at, at Socrates or Jesus or Confucius or Buddha or Marcus Aurelius, th the whatever the, the highest state of one of these schools or philosophies is, they're defined by a, a quiet, by a self-control, by a calmness. And so ultimately the, the book is about how, how do you access that, how do you use it, uh, whether you're playing professional sports or uh, you're, you work in Hollywood or you just have an ordinary job or you're uh, a parent. And so it's not easy to practice, certainly. Uh, I struggle with it. When I woke up to my calendar this morning and it started at, uh, 
you know, nine and it was nonstop stuff until I came here today, there's this sort of anxiety, this worry, how am I gonna get through it all? Um, and this is exactly where I think the stillness that we want comes from. So what I thought I'd do is I just sort of walk through like my schedule. I just I walk through my practice. How does how, how does one sort of find room and time for stillness when when things are busy or hard? And so uh, I'll look at today and yesterday because they're they're both a little different. Obviously, you got to adapt to the particular circumstance of the day. But I think uh, the the first thing I do is I wake up early. Um, I have a three-year-old, so I don't have to use an alarm clock most of the time. That, that's taken care of for me. Um, but I woke up at six yesterday, seven today, and I, you wake up early if stillness is the goal because you want to get started before the interruptions and the distractions do. When you wake up to a quiet house or you wake up to uh, an inbox that hasn't quite filled up yet, you have an advantage. Um, and so you wake up early. I think this is the key. Uh, Shane Parrish, who writes for Farnham Street, he, he has this, he's like the number one productivity advice is just wake up earlier. You wake up and you start the day and you get as many of the things done you need to do in the day before other people are up, before the distractions have time to, uh, to get in the way, right? So you start early, that's what I did. Uh, this morning I started with a run. Yesterday I started with a run and then a swim. Um, I think some form of strenuous exercise is how we, uh, how we access stillness. So um, I love, uh, I used to do CrossFit, I like CrossFit. The problem was CrossFit wasn't getting me, physically it was great, but uh, mentally it wasn't what I wanted because I'm surrounded by other people, I'm having to follow instructions, I'm doing these sort of complicated things. I, want, I, I think solitary exercise is, is, is deeply important, less for the physical um, benefits and more for the emotional and mental benefits. So I went for, uh, today it was a long run in, in Central Park, um, yesterday it was a run, and then I swam uh, at the New York Athletic Club. I think swimming, underrated also as a form of exercise, it's the one place where there are no screens. Um, it's uh, naturally uh, almost womb-like. There's a sensory deprivation element to swimming that I think is important. Um, and uh, I don't even listen to music, right? Uh, although it is possible now. I, the, the point is I want to experience some isolating, quiet time from the world, not touching the phone, not thinking about uh, anything but the lap that I'm swimming or the, the distance that I'm running. Um, the other thing I started, I started this about uh, eight or nine months ago. My new rule is I don't use my phone for the first 30 minutes to one hour of waking up. So I sleep, I, I, if you're sleeping with your phone in your room, I think you're setting yourself up for failure. Just the existence of the phone in your room is making you wanna use it. So I go to bed whenever I go to bed, and then whatever time I wake up, I don't touch the phone for one hour plus that. So I'm getting you know eight, nine hours minimum of no phone time, which is you know more than most people statistically at this point. But what I, what I want is I want to start the day without even knowing whether I'm already underwater as far as my emails go, whether there's been uh, you know a bunch of text messages, whether I got invited to this thing or that thing. I wanna be in the right headspace, not in the headspace where I'm reactive to something else. The amount of people that I know whose day uh, is ruined seconds after it started because you know Donald Trump went on a tweet storm while they were sleeping is, is unfortunately quite sad, right? And so how can you start the day without the intrusions uh, be, uh, you know, sort of marking the beginning of the day? So I, uh, so I started uh, this habit with 10 minutes. It was hard to go 10 minutes after I woke up without checking my phone and then I pushed it to 15 and then uh, 30, 45, an hour. And sometimes now I can go you know, until lunchtime. Um, on Saturdays and Sundays, I try not to, to use the phone at all. Um, how can you set time where you are using the phone rather than the phone using you? And if you are instinctually using it, I, I think that's probably a problem. So we'll start there and then uh, I sit down with a journal. I use uh, about three journals. Um, I use this one that I love that's called One Line a Day. And I write one sentence about the day that's just passed. And so I can see, I've done this now about three and a half years, I can see three and a half years of what I did on this exact day, right? And so I have some sense of where the trajectory of my life is going. Then I write in just a blank notebook. I just 
dump out thoughts or get them uh, off my off my shoulders or out of my head and I have literally a, some distance between me and my thoughts. I think that's important. Then I do, uh, it would be weird if I didn't, I do the Daily Stoic Journal, um, which gives a, a, a prompt in the morning and then a prompt in the evening. But the idea is like intentionally, what am I thinking about today? What am I working on? Uh, what, what are the virtues that I'm trying to embody? What, like I want to start the day with some prompt um, and, and for whatever reason, uh, even though I wrote them and even though I know what they are, they seem to magically align with whatever uh, I'm thinking with or struggling about. There are questions about like, you know, does this need to make you angry? What if you let this go? You're going to care about this in a while, right? Um, how can I prepare for misfortune, right? And just having some random question to think about is, is super important. But it's the quiet time of sitting down again before the screens have started, of just thinking and putting thoughts down on paper that work really well. And then I go immediately into whatever my creative project or practice for that day is. So um, it's usually writing. I usually start with uh, the emails that we do for Daily Stoic. I try to write one or two. Or if I have an article that I want to write, or if I'm working on a book, I do a couple chapters, uh, or sorry, I work on whatever the chapter is for the day. But I want to do, I want to do the creative work as early as possible again. And I just go until I hit the point of diminishing returns. So I, I wrote this morning for about an hour. And then when that was done, um, I've, already essentially won the day. That's like, as far as being a writer goes, like I've done my profession. So if I end up doing more, this is wonderful. Um, if I don't, it's also not a problem. So I start there. This morning I actually ended up doing my writing as I sat in the lobby of the Sirius XM building waiting for, um, uh, waiting for the show I was gonna be on to start. So you can cram these things in wherever. Um, I, I, I talk about a live time, dead time in my ego book. How can you make sure there's not dead time where you're not wasting time, where you're not sitting around? Um, that's where I went into the creative practice. Um, and you just do it, right? It, it's not always uh, a good day. You don't always do as well as you want, but the point is that you do it every day. People ask how I write so many books. It's because I'm just always writing. And they seem books, finished books, seem to come out of the other side of this process, right? You don't... Um, think about publishing, you think about the process and you think about producing and at the end of this comes publishable work. If you are focused on the outcome, I find um, you're either intimidated by it, you delay, this is where the resistance comes in, or you're just, um, you know, you're, you're just thinking about the wrong thing. Time you spend thinking about outcome is uh, energy and focus that's not going into the actual thing that you're supposed to do. The other important part of the, my daily practice is some form of reading. So as I drove around the city in a car from place to place, that's where I read today. I wasn't on my phone. I wasn't answering email. I was reading. I'm reading the uh, Bruce, String Bruce Springsteen autobiography. It's very good. Um, but that's how I filled that gap. And so, again, I would do an interview. I'd be, you know, uh, stressed or worked up. And then I would have sort of a detox time where I'd go into reading. Um, I don't, I, I don't usually set aside time to do reading. I just fill it into the cracks of the rest of the day. So like I like to read while I eat. Um, I read while I'm waiting for things. I just, that's where I fill it in. But I think some quiet time reading is important. I talk in this book about the importance of relationships. I think we, we can think of relationships as being something that drain us or that distract us or take up time. People go, I don't have time for a relationship. I'm focused on my career. I don't have time for a relationship. I'm working on this or that. To me, relationships are something you draw energy from. So, you know, it was moments where I was, you know, FaceTiming with my kid in the car or talking to my wife on the phone. I want to be checking in on relationships because I think relationships are a source of stillness. They're a source of, um, you know, a, they're a place to check uh, frustrations that you feel against, uh, to check thoughts against, to get another perspective on yourself. So it's some sort of relationship uh, time. And then I do a walk. Every day I do a walk of some kind. I don't count this walk as exercise. The walk is purely for the meditative aspect. There is something called walking meditation, uh, which is important. And when I'm at home, I usually do the walk in the morning. I don't exercise in the morning at home. I do the walk in the morning. Um, I take my son for a walk in a stroller. Um, and we just go outside and we walk. And there's no purpose to this walk. I'm not counting the steps. It's not some goal that I have. It's just the experience of walking. Um, 
I talk a, a little bit about in the book, this, there's this Japanese concept of forest bathing, um, going out into nature and being washed by this thing that's larger than yourself. Um, it's a little harder to do in New York City, uh, but there are parks. Uh, and, and so how can you go out and experience nature in some way? I, uh, I did Gary V's podcast today, and, and Gary was like, you know what I hate? I hate nature. <laughs> um, uh, which is, you know, it's sort of uh, classic Gary. But the point is, I think uh, there there are studies that show just experiencing the green of nature has psychological and health benefits. Um, so the walk is important. If you can't just walk for the sake of walking because you don't have time, uh, what I do, um, not on my farms, they don't get cell reception, but uh, when I'm in the city or when I'm traveling, I do all my phone calls while I walk. And so I say up front, I go, look, I'm outside. If that doesn't work for you, uh, we can cancel this call, but I'm gonna walk. And I walk while I do the phone calls. Um, and some, uh, actually, um, when I landed here on, on Monday, I had a, an hour interview I had to do with someone, and I walked three miles. And so it, even though it's not as great, um, you know, the fact that I'm doing something while walking is not as ideal as just being present and walking. The meditative aspect of, of just walking and aimlessly wandering around and being outside still has the benefit. Um, Another really important part of my practice this is more something I don't do than something I do. I don't watch the news. And let me tell you, it was quite difficult to not watch the news as I was literally at uh, NBC today um, and CNBC. Uh, but uh, I don't watch the news. Um, I think uh, cable television news is like the worst thing you could possibly put in your body. I'd rather, you know, like drink soda or eat at McDonald's. Um, the, the, this is designed to provoke you, and if you think about what the news is designed to do, it's designed uh, not to inform you, because if it informed you, you wouldn't need to watch any more news, right? The purpose of the news is to make you continue watching the news. It's not, people go, oh, but isn't your civic duty to be informed? Um, yes, your civic duty is to be informed. Uh, your civic duty is not to, uh, watch CNN or MSNBC or Fox News. Um, I would argue that the best way to be informed is to read uh, books. I'm, uh, I happen to be partial to books. <laughs> um, what's, a, what's a fundamental difference between the books and uh, the news? Uh, you pay for books, right? I have a relation, if, if I write a book and you don't like it, um, you can return it, uh, or you'll never buy from me again. News is typically worth what you pay for it, which is usually nothing. Um, and, uh, and, and when you look at the economics or the incentives of the news businesses, in most cases, uh, their incentive is to make something, again, not that's true, but something that will drive you to share it on social media in some form or another. And what we tend to find is that the triggers that make people share things on social media are... Um, the number, for instance, the number one predictor of, of, of social spread is how angry something makes you. So should it surprise us that whether you're a liberal or a conservative, the news seems to constantly be showing how outrageous the world is, right? Of course, it's not a coincidence. This is their business model. I'm actually not sure how bad things actually are right now and how much of this is a reflection of what the medium needs, uh, needs to provide for us so we continue to consume it. Um, and, and then I would urge you to think, if you are someone who reads a lot of news, who thinks, oh, I'm being informed, this is what, uh, this is my civic duty. How many decisions do you actually make on this information? You already know who you're probably gonna vote for. You already know most of your stands on the issue. What you're really doing is seeing where this is going to go. Here's a funny fact. It's gonna go where it's gonna go. You can just check in at the end, right? <laughs> I, I, think, I think about this with sports, right? Um, you turn on Sports Center right now or you turn on FS1, they're gonna be speculating about is so-and-so gonna play this weekend? Uh, what is the NFL gonna rule on, um, on, this, you know, on, on this player or that player? Um, is so-and-so gonna hold out? Is so-and-so gonna report to training camp? Uh, is, is what kind of offense is this team gonna run next week ad nauseum? Guess what? It just happens, right? No amount of following it in real time changes what it's going to be. It just is what it is. I think it's wonderful to watch sports on Sunday or to tune into a baseball game or an NBA game. The problem is thinking that watching the speculations or the opinions about it in advance 
that, 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 that influences the event in some way. And we do this politically, right? You elected people that are either going to impeach Donald Trump or they're not going to impeach Donald Trump. Watching a panel discuss whether it's going to happen or not going to ha happen does not impact it in any way. All it does is make you upset, make you worried, get you to have an opinion about things. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from Marcus Aurelius, he goes, it's possible to not have an opinion about something. Um, you can just see where it goes. And then once it's gone there, then you can have an opinion. Um, and so I, I try to, to consume as little news as possible. People ask how, again, how are you so productive? How do you read so many books? I don't watch the news, right? Uh, I don't spend time doing this. And if I'm gonna spend the news watching mindless entertainment, I'm gonna watch something that's enjoyably entertaining, not something that tells me that the world is on fire. One of, the, one of the other practices I do, I talk about this in the book, it's the idea of emptying the mind. So, uh, you know, I, I wake up in the morning and I see today's schedule and it's stressful and I have stuff I have to go do. Um, and I have all these emails. I, I try to uh, zoom in and push all of that aside. We, we have, not only do you have the power not to have an opinion, you have, the power, you have the power to think nothing. You can let your thoughts sort of move by. In Buddhism, they talk about, and in meditation, they talk about the idea of seeing your thoughts as clouds, and you can push the clouds aside, you can let them breeze on by. You don't have to seize on to any of them. Um, you can allow the mind to be empty. You can allow the mind to be totally focused on the task in front of you or what you're supposed to be doing or what you're trying to do. I tell the story in the book of Sean Green, one of the great home run hitters of our time. And, and when he's in this sort of career defining slump, he realizes that, he realizes how presumptuous and insane it is that he's gonna stand up there facing great pitchers and be thinking about the slump that he's in. It, there's the Yogi Berra line, it's impossible to hit and think at the same time, or to think and hit at the same time. And what he means is that there's like 400 milliseconds between the time the ball leaves the pitcher's hand and by the time it arrives at the, at the batter's box. And so the idea that you can be thinking about what you're gonna do tomorrow, that you can be thinking about the argument that you had with the coach uh, you know, before the game, that you can be thinking about your batting average, um, you can be thinking about what they're saying about you on Twitter, all of this is using up precious resources that you can't afford to expel, right? You have to, be, you have to be clearing the mind and you have to zoom in on what's in front of you. And so this is something I practice when I get stressed. I try to remember my, that I don't have to be thinking about anything, that I can clear the mind and then I can come home or I can come back to whatever the task is in front of me. If I'm writing and I'm starting to think about what this is gonna look like when it's published, or I'm gonna think about whether people are going to like it or not, or whether I think about whether I'm making progress or not. Again, all of these are thoughts that are taking me away from the really hard task that's in front of me, which is writing, which is producing more words. And so you empty the mind, you come back to what you're doing, and then you're able to do that thing better. This is really important. This idea of being present, um, the Stoics go, you can't change what's happened in the past. You have almost no control over what's going to happen in the future. The only thing that you have is what's in front of you right now. You only control the present. And so this reminder time, uh, time and time again of how little power we have and, <clears throat> and how little is in our control might seem uh, like a kind of resignation, and it is. You're resigning or you're jettisoning out all the things that most people are thinking about um, which is sort of impotent frustration or, or um, the expressing of preference over things that are indifferent to you. And what you will instead want to focus on is what is in front of you. You want to actually enjoy this moment. Um, when I'm really busy, when I'm not in my sort of ideal uh, environment, when I'm not at home, when I'm not totally in control of my, my schedule, I, I, I can feel this sort of anxiety creeping up that I have so much I have to do um, and then I'm running out of time. And, and one of the practices that I try to do that I've tried to work on today is this reminder that what I have in front of me is what I have to be doing. I don't have to do this and my normal things. That's, that's the anxiety or the, 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 the burden that I sort of wrongly pick up. I go, um, I have to do these interviews, I have to do this talk, but I also have to get back to inbox zero, right? Um, I also have to respond to this. I also have to see what these alerts have prompted me to do. And this is, uh, this is untrue, right? Um, 
I get emails uh, from people like you all the time. It's it's quite nice. I don't always respond uh, in time. What I do is I I mark them and I come back to them when I do have time. And and what what I what I find when I reply is uh, people go, oh, I never thought you would would get back to me. And so I realized that any anxiety that I felt about not responding fast enough um, was not from them. This is a, a, a projection that I brought to the UK. And so you find so many of the things that we feel um, worried about, whether it's being late or whether it's not being totally caught up or not being perfect or not doing everything the way that we think. These are, um, these are burdens that we voluntarily assumed. And if instead we can be present, if we can empty the mind, if we can just focus on the task in front of us, we'll do better, we'll be more present, we'll be able to be more grateful, we'll enjoy what we're doing. So ultimately, the, the definition of, of stillness that I'm talking about is something, it's, I, I see it as a practice. It's not something that happens accidentally. Um, it's something that you certainly can make impossible in your life, right? How many people have chosen to live in such a way that stillness is, is never possible for them, right? They've closed the door on it. And so my feeling is if you can close the door on it, you can certainly also make decisions or engage in practices in such a way that uh, open the door for it. And so when I think about routine, when I think about uh, habits, uh, when I think about uh, how I want to live, I, I want to live in such a way that opens the door to stillness. Like w when I when I say that word, um, uh, it's weird. When I when I wrote uh, ego is the enemy, a lot of people asked, you know, what's the definition of ego? It's interesting when I when I wrote this book, very few people have asked that question because I think instinctually, intuitively, naturally, we know what stillness is. Everyone has experienced that moment. Manifest itself differently. We know there's lots of different forms of stillness, but everyone's experienced it in some form or another. And I think uh, every time we've experienced it, it's special. We know that stillness is wonderful, that uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a welcome experience when we have it. And, and sort of the genesis of this book is, was thinking, okay, if stillness is so wonderful, why is it so rare, right? Why, if it's so, uh, if it's so enjoyable, why is it something that happens accidentally? Why is it something that happens fleetingly? How come we don't actively practice it, we don't cultivate it? And so ultimately what the book is, the habits and the schedule that I was just talking to you about, what, that, what the purpose of that is to facilitate stillness, to make it possible, to encourage it, to, to bring it out. Um, because I think stillness is ultimately what makes life wor worth living. Um, it's also where elite performance comes. The best work that I've done has come from a place of stillness, not a place from anxiety. It's come from a place of stillness, not a place of franticness. Um, it's come from a place of being very intentional. It's not come uh, from a place of, uh, of, of, of anything but that. And so if stillness is important, it shouldn't be rare. And what we can do is we can make decisions and we can build a life that facilitates it and makes it possible. But we have to decide that it's a priority. So if you notice in, in The Obstacle is the Way uh, and Ego is the Enemy, and then in this title, I try to write and create books that the title is enough, right? The title, if you, if you forget everything in the book or you don't bother to read it, the title can teach something, right? Um, and I think, there is no situation uh, in which uh, the obstacle does not present some advantage when it is not actually a way forward. There's no situation that I've found uh, that is improved by the introduction of ego. I don't think many of you have ever been anywhere where you thought, you know, it would fix this if we could bring some bigger egos in here. Uh, no one has ever said that. And then uh, stillness is the key. What is, it that th what is it the key to? It's the key to everything. Um, when Marcus Aurelius is talking about the idea of, he says, the ocean rages around the rock and then eventually uh, becomes still around it. That approach, that, um, that strength, that purpose, that unbendingness um, is very powerful and it's the key to better work, uh, better personal life, uh, more creativity, uh, more happiness. It's the key to everything. So I hope the book helps unlock this for some of you. I hope the strategies become something that you practice in your lives. And I uh, really appreciate you guys having me. And let's kick around some questions.
If you guys want to raise your hands, I'll bring the mic. I'll try and do a and big loop some around the room. And we have Daily Stoic Challenge coins for the first couple people that answer a question. So uh, let's go. Hey, Ryan. Um, when did you decide to make this a trilogy? Uh, certainly not at the beginning. Um, it, uh, the Obstacles Away was a contained book. Ego is the Enemy was, in many ways, a totally it was not planned to be a sequel. Um, but as I iterated on the idea, it became clear and clear to me that the format of Obstacle was the right way to do it again, and that I liked the style, and that I thought it was the best way. To, so, so after uh, Ego became a sequel to to Obstacle. Then I thought about what I wanted the next one to be. So it, it sort of ensued naturally, but it's definitely the end of, I, I definitely see it as a trilogy. It's not, there's not gonna be an accidental fourth one. There are three books in the same style teaching similar but overlapping lessons and you can start, unlike some trilogies, you can start at the end or the beginning or the middle. There's no order in which I think the books need to be read. Hello. Hi. Not just with the trilogy, but with all the books you've written, what sort of growth and progress have you seen, not only as a writer, but as a person? There's a, a really interesting letter uh, from Seneca, and he's talking to Lucilius, and he says something like, you ask what progress I've made, I've, 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 uh, I've gotten better at being my own friend. And I think he's talking actually about stillness. What he means is like, am I not... Am I less the problem, right? Like, am I, have I reduced the things that I bring to the chaos or the randomness of the world uh, that make life harder, right? And that's sort of the story that I open the book with. You know, S Seneca is sitting there in this apartment in Rome experiencing a scene that, if you change only a few details, could describe exactly what I saw out of my hotel window this morning, right? The police are, you know, arresting someone. People are selling things. There's the noise of traffic. There's the noise of construction. And, and he says that's a problem, but he says the real problem is what we have going on inside. It's the noise in our own head. And so I think um, I've, I've felt like I'm certainly more capable of stillness now than when I started the book. I think uh, I did work on my own ego, writing the ego book. I think uh, one of the nice parts about writing books about stoicism is that you're forced to live up to the principles that you talk about uh, as much as possible, although certainly not in, in any sort of perfect consistency. So I think I'm just trying to write lessons to myself uh, and then hopefully whatever is universal in my own experience that will work for other people too. Yeah. Any questions further back maybe? Hey, Ryan, nice to see you again. Hi, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about, as your profile has grown, obviously, and you've had more demands on your schedule, Yeah. I'd love to know how you think about employing those strategies for the audiences that you're speaking to. So you're, you're talking about, you know, the ego is the enemy to football players. Yeah. And they're dealing with this sort of internal tumult all the time and this propensity towards violence. So I'd love to know how you think about stillness when you're in a room full of people who are like paid millions of dollars to hit each other in the yeah. head. Yeah. Well, in, in a way, um, the, the books work in sports because all of the problems that we have in uh, normal life are exaggerated and uh, larger than life in sports, right? Um, we can go around thinking all everyone's paying attention to us and that you know everyone's watching our every move. But if you're a professional athlete, that is what's happening, right? Um, you really people are really telling you that you're the greatest ever, you know. And 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 yet, if you believe that, that's when progress ceases and that's when you start to become complacent. So um, this idea of, for instance, talking about um, you know what's in your control versus what's not in your control. When I talked to the Browns at training camp this year, that's what I talked about. I was like, look, like. You control how you play. You don't control um, if the coach plays you. You know, you control how you show up in practice. You don't control if you get traded. You know, you control how you play. You don't control the ref's call about the play. It doesn't matter how much money uh, you're making. It doesn't matter how good the team is. Nothing changes that underlying fact. You control how you play. You don't control what they say about you on Twitter. You control how you play. You don't control what they say about you on SportsCenter. You control how you play. You don't control if somebody takes out your knee and you're out for the rest of the season, right? You really only control yourself. 
your, uh, your actions, your opinions, the mindset that you bring, the commitment that you have, you control like sort of what's on the inside of here, and even then, not, not completely. Uh, and so, um, you're, you're, I'm just talking about the same things I'm talking about here. What I think is actually awesome about sports and earnest is like, the things that would be cliche in real life, athletes take very seriously because there isn't a lot of room for complexity. You know, it's like, can't think and hit at the same time. Good, I'll take that. You know, leave it all in the jersey. They're like, good, I'll take that. You know, they're just like, there's an earnestness to the sort of commitment to excellence and, uh, you know, the process in sports that I think regular people would, would benefit more from. And one further back over here. Yeah, sure. Hey, Ryan, thanks hey. for coming. Yeah. I have two questions, one serious, one kind of fun. Uh, the first one, uh, there's a lot of you know supplements. People use different anchors to help get them into stillness. Yeah. Uh, do you have any thoughts on maybe uh, CBD, THC, or maybe even just different smells, incense to help you get yeah. to stillness? And then the other one, very quick, um, are you going to get stillness as the key tattooed? Yeah, I have it already. You have it? Okay. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Uh, yes. So a, a couple years ago, someone gave me this incense powder that, that he said is like a Buddhist tradition where you put it on your hands and you rub it and then you smell it and it's supposed to like help you go into whatever place you're wanting to go on. I love it in theory. I just like never get around to using it. Um, and it's sort of my attitude about meditation too. I, sounds great in practice. I just like, I don't know. It seems complicated. I'd rather just, I, I, wait, one of the things I, I was very deliberate in this book is I don't think I mentioned meditation a single time. Um, I wanted to, because the reality is like, uh, most people just don't meditate. They won't, they're not interested, they've tried, it hasn't worked. And so I wanted to tackle this idea of stillness from every angle but that one. And so I think there are sort of rituals or practices. Some people have a bell that they ring or they, they have all this stuff. And I think that can work, but I, but I also think go for a walk and get up early, you know, you can um, just get started. I, so I, I don't have anything like super great to share. I just kind of just do it. Anybody on this side? Sorry, he decides the question, so <laughs> you don't uh, have to look at me. Two things. Yeah. You were saying all of your walking and your swimming, that is a form of meditation. Mm -hmm. So you are getting a chance to have s some mindfulness and yes. practice. Mm -hmm. And I guess the more important question is now that the trilogy is complete, yeah. what's next? Another book, and then another book, <laughs> and then another book, and then another book. Uh, I'm, I'm just always, I'm always writing. And, and one of the things that I try to do is I do try to line up the next project and possibly the project after that, not, not, not as a hedge against failure, but also an insulation against success. Right, um, one of the benefits, so Obstacle came out and it, it sold well at first, but didn't like blow the doors off. Um, but I'd already sold the next book. So the idea of like, hey, it could have sold better, that wasn't a thought that entered my mind because like I was already working on the next thing. And then when it did really start to sell, when the sales did pick up, again, it didn't really matter. I had deadlines to meet. And so I, I like to be working. Um, and I, I, like I said, I try not to think about outcomes. I just always want to be working. So one can, last coin, one do last the question. Iron Maiden question. I think this is uh, fitting. Thank you. For is that that's from this tour, right? Yes, Where did yeah. you see them? Barclays, Capricio. Nice, very yeah. cool. I saw uh, them in San Antonio uh, uh, last week. So yeah. I, I gave a talk to the the Spurs last week, and my uh, part of my stipulation for agreeing to do it was that they had to get me tickets to see Iron Maiden. <laughs> Um, <laughs> because it was at it was at the arena, and they did. Uh, it was awesome. Um, but uh, there's this place like down the street from the stadium, uh, from the AT&T Center, that sells a three-pound cinnamon roll, yeah. um, <laughs> and uh, and they also uh, have a 21-ounce chicken fried steak. And I I decided it would be a good idea not only to see Iron Maiden the night before the talk, but to also go to this restaurant beforehand. And it was a brutal couple of days. I'll just put it that. Way. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no um, so you speak about, you know, stillness and practicing stillness and all of your different methods, but how do you avoid, like, not pissing people off whilst, like, pursuing this and not annoying people? What do you mean? Like, so you speak about not using your phone for an hour in the morning, like, yeah. but what if someone really needs to get a hold of you and they say, like, Ryan, why do you always avoid my emails in the morning, you know? 
That's literally never happened. Really? Like, yeah, it's just never happened. Uh, I think one of the reasons we uh, always have, our, we tell ourselves that there's going to be this emergency or the, uh, it just, I just don't think it happens. Like, it's like, uh, it just doesn't, <laughs> it just doesn't happen. And, and I mean, realistically, like, okay, I got to it an hour later, you know, that 10 years ago, that would have been totally normal. And a hundred years ago, they would have had to write me a letter <laughs> and the, the letter might have taken weeks to arrive, you know? So I think what technology has done a really good job of is making us dependent on the technology. And it, it's, um, they're working on a, a movie adaptation of, of Conspiracy, and I was talking to the screenwriter about this. <coughs> it's, it's actually been really hard for them to capture what two th 2007 was like. Like, uh, before, the, the iPhone hasn't really launched yet. Um, uh, YouTube is just, kind of, like, we've so taken for granted that this is how we consume media, this is what the fabric of reality looks like, we can't even remember that it wasn't always like this. And, and that's one of the brilliant business uh, opportunities that technology, as soon as you use it, you're like, I don't want to go back to life before. But the truth is you're just totally fine without it. Um, and so I, I'm always leery of anything that makes you utterly dependent on it. And so, um, yeah, it just, it just hasn't, it just hasn't happened. Uh, it just hasn't happened. Do we have time for any more or I can keep Yeah, going. I'm out of coins, but if you want oh, to take some more sure, questions. Oh, sure, yeah, okay. We can just keep doing questions, you just don't get yeah. anything for it. <laughs> So kind of building on what you were just saying about how time has changed and all, uh, there is somewhat an expectation today to keeping up with social media and w how people see you. Uh, yeah. Like I'm just in the field that I'm in, like uh, let's say for artists, everyone's competing to yeah. get to places and you have to present yourself, you have to be present sure. in the world, but that kind of by itself brings a lot of anxiety and brings a lot of responsibilities that takes you away from the work that you have to do. Yeah. So how do you bring stillness into that? Yeah, it's a, it's a balance. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm on social media. I have it. I know that it, it, there's an ROI to it. Um, I know that it's sort of part of the profession at this point, although I know plenty of writers that don't, right? And I know plenty of artists that don't, but it, 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 you have to be really, really, really good <laughs> to justify not, you know, to, to, to sort of not, take advantage of those things. So what I, I just think about what are smart ways to do it. So like I have an Instagram account, it's just not on my phone. It's on my wife's phone. So I have to get her phone if I want to post something. And so that just doesn't happen that much, right? Uh, or I just send her the photo and then she posts it. But I don't, uh, I can't mindlessly scroll while I'm doing it, right? Um, or like when Twitter came out, it made my life better. I got access to information. I could see the perspective of interesting people. And the first you know, four or five years I used Twitter and Facebook too, it was on the desktop. So it was when I was sitting down at a computer working. Um, I find that to be a pretty healthy interface to engage on those platforms. I don't have them on my phone because when, they're th when it's on my phone, I'm literally carrying it with me. So it's just uh, what's a, what are ways that you can limit your exposure to these things so you're using them rather than them using you. And the, uh, it, let's say you do keep them on your phone. I, I was talking to a, an artist. He's like, I don't have a computer. I just use my phone. So great, makes total sense. But let's make sure you don't have alerts on your phone so every time, some, like the, as part of a, a Daily Stoic challenge I did at the beginning of this year, I quit. Uh, Facebook. So I deleted, I didn't delete my account, I just changed the password on it. I don't know what it is. I started a new account that doesn't have any friends. So if I need to log in to something or whatever, I have like some Facebook groups. But the point is I don't have an account that I'm actively using. It doesn't really have any. It's incredible. This account that has almost no personal information about me uh, whatsoever the other day asked me if I wanted, uh, gave me, uh, suggested that I be friends with my agent who's here. And it's like, how did it possibly know that, right? Or, um, you know, it's like, oh, do you want to be friends with this person you went to high school with? How does it know that? So when you step back from the technology a little bit, um, it gives you a sense of how much these technologies are manipulating you. Yeah, I was, uh, I was hearing someone talk about it. Maybe it's true, but it sounds true. Uh, that, that like, for instance, Instagram, 
uh, because variable rewards are one of the most addicting things. So it's like, if you do this, you get X. If you do this, you get X. That's somewhat addictive. But it's like, if you do this, you could get 10X or you could get 100X and it's random. That's what makes us check all the time. Like a, a slot machine, they know like just the point where you're about to quit. That's when they give you something. So anyways, like you post a picture on Instagram. Sometimes it tells you, you got all these likes right away. Other times it trickles them out, so you keep checking. And the fact that it's random, that it's not something you can get used to, is how it can, so there's all these forces that are working on those platforms that I think make it not a good idea to give them unfettered access to your mind. So turning off alerts, managing how you use them, maybe not controlling the password to the account, or only checking them on certain days, these are ways that you can get the benefits of the platform, but not be at the mercy of them. Take maybe one or two. Try to work my way back again. Thanks for coming. Thank you for coming. I had to come. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the Ritual podcast, you were talking about uh, the artist is present. Yes. And so, could you speak more to the significance or the meaning of having stillness in a relationship? In a relationship? Uh, how does that connect to the artist is present? I'm just curious. People were like weeping in front of the oh, artists, and sure, there was something sure. about the presence that was a big deal. So I, I have a chapter in the book about Marina Abramovich. She did this uh, retrospective at MoMA, and the performance is she basically sat in a chair every day for like 45 or 60 consecutive days. It's like an incredible athletic feat as well as an artistic feat. And there's a great documentary, I think it's on Amazon, it might be on Netflix, called The Artist is Present, all about it. Um, but you can watch video of these, like just, People are so not present in their life that just sitting across from someone who is present drove many people to tears. Like it was a almost religious experience for some people because again, presence is so rare. Um, I don't. I, I think uh, it's very hard to be in a good, healthy, uh, connected relationship if you're not present. If you're on your phone, if you're somewhere else, if you're thinking about someone else, if you're thinking about other things, if you have other priorities in the relationship. So. Um, I think presence is, there, there's very few things, maybe other than like really painful things you don't want to have happen, that are not enhanced by or th improved by presence. So um, if you're not there, uh, what does that say about the situation? It says you don't want to be there. So I think it's a critical part of relationships. Hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> How would you um, encourage teenagers to incorporate stillness? Yeah, I don't have a teenager, so I don't have a ton of advice. Um, but if it's like if, let's say, social media and technology is hard for us, I, I can't even wrap my head around what it's like to be 13. Um, at least I get paid to have an Instagram account, right? Like there's an ROI. It, I don't feel like my identity or my self-worth is rooted in it because I was lucky enough to grow up without these things. And so I think it's really, really hard. Um, I, haven't, I haven't cracked the code on it or anything, so I, I won't really offer any strategies. But I think you've got to, people have to understand that the digital world is not real life and that it is designed to exploit and manipul manipulate you. And you have to find ways to create identity outside of this thing. And um, I think the re, uh, but and it, uh, again, look if it can if it can radicalize New York Times reporters and you know uh, otherwise smart people, what is it doing to to people who don't have the perspective or the the life experience to know that this is not real life? Um, it's just yeah, it's really it's really tough. It's really bad. Um, Cal Newport was saying that I think. Uh, he was saying in the future we're going to look back at letting kids use social media the way that you know kids used to be able to smoke at school or <laughs> buy cigarettes out of a vending machine. You know, I, I think I think we're going to look back at this with some some level of horror. Um, we don't let them gamble, don't let them smoke. You know, you can't market certain things to kids um, because we know they're susceptible to them. That that these billion dollar companies would be allowed to do that is I think is very alarming. Want to do one more? One last question. Sure. Hey, Ryan. Hi. Uh, so my question is kind of catered toward your opinion now. And I also, I'm curious as if, to, if you mentioned it in the book at all. 
Uh, so earlier you were mentioning stillness in re in regards to you and your yeah. lifestyle. Um, I want to know for someone whose lifestyle is maybe more demanding of their time, like let's say the the average person whose work they maybe might be starting at the time that you're waking up. How sure. can you how can you relatively say they can fit like stillness into their schedule or how it can help their mindset? Yeah. So on on the one hand, the sort of creative life offers certain freedoms in that I can sort of decide the order that I want to do things. Um, the downside is like I can decide how I want to do things, which means that we all this is where the that's idea of the resistance comes in. The fact that I, the fact that we can choose our own schedule is why a lot of writers aren't productive because there isn't sort of a gun to their head saying you have to work from this time to this time. And so there's advantages and disadvantages to it. Uh, I certainly accept there's privileges and benefits to, uh, you know, what I get to do and, and where I am in my career. But you know, I wrote three books while I had two simultaneous day jobs. So, um, you know, I've written books while I own my own company. I've written books while, you know, uh, while I've had two young kids. Like, you, uh, you just make it, you make it work, right? Uh, you get up earlier, you go to bed earlier, um, you don't do the things that a lot of people do that waste time. You know, when you look at the amount of time that the average person spends watching television or consuming the news or just generally sort of waste, of course no one gets anything done. So you just gotta decide what you're gonna prioritize in your life. And it's certainly harder earlier on, um, and it's harder uh, as you're getting started. But to me, the point of success and the point of what you're working towards is, is autonomy. At the beginning you have less autonomy, um, but you're working towards getting it. And you just find where you have, where do you have choices inside your busy, so you do decide when you wake up, might have to be at four in the morning, but you also decide when you go to bed, right? And so it's just sort of making those choices within what you're gonna do. Um, again, not easy, don't mean to be glib about it, but ultimately you just gotta decide what's, what's important to you. And, and I guess what I would say is like, lots of, as hard as whatever your day is, or people in the room that are not, in, like really successful people have written books while they're in, not, not, people have written brilliant works when they're in prison, people have written you know, brilliant books while they had eight kids to raise, people have written books in poverty, and I don't just mean to say books, people have done really hard things from much more unenviable conditions than whatever we happen to be in. And you know, uh, one of my favorite uh, Marcus Aurelius quotes, he says, uh, if it's humanly possible, assume that it's possible for you. And so like, if they could do it from harder circumstances, I'm gonna find some way to be half as productive or a quarter as productive and I'll count that as success. Well, thank you all for your thank questions. You and Ryan, thank you so Appreciate much for being here. Work.